Hello, welcome back. We're on day two and I'm with Max Porterfield, the president and CEO of Carnex Mines. Max, good to see you. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. More than welcome. Um, why don't you, for those less familiar, just a brief overview of the company and we'll dive in. Yes, yeah, so we're an exploration company focused in Canada. We've got emerging discoveries just outside of Flintlon and the Flintlon Grandstone Belts, uh, where we've and it recently announced a high grade copper resource. Uh, these are VMS deposits, they're polymetallic, so aside from the high grade copper, they do carry gold, silver, and zinc as byproducts. And then deeper in the portfolio that we're not focused on advancing, we do have some uh, resource base in the Maritimes in Eastern Canada. The entire portfolio is focused in proximity to infrastructure. Obviously, the pedigree of the geology is what led to the infrastructure being there. That really reduces a lot of your upfront capital costs for once you make a discovery. Okay, and just uh, run me through your current capital structure, if you don't mind. In terms of cap structure, it's very tightly held. We have 17 and a half million shares outstanding. Uh, myself and my family have collectively owned up about 10% of the company. Okay, good. Uh, we've got a really strong institutional support with the likes of 1832, Altius, McKenzie, to name a few, Resource Capital Plus has been a very long term shareholder. Good. Uh, so, again, it's very tightly held by management, institutions, uh, and the low float. Good. Okay. No, no debt. No debt. Oh, that's always nice. Um, Right, really high grade, right? So you're talking in the main indicated resource body over 3% copper equivalent. Um, right, yeah. So in the, in the indicated category for Rainbow, which is our largest resource that we, uh, on the property that we uh, announced last July, it's 3.14% copper, 3.65% copper equivalent. Yep. Again, that's the byproducts there in open sea. So again, super high grade. Uh, very pleased with uh, how Rainbow has emerged. Uh, and you're excited to unlock value and even core with other discoveries. Good. And so I think the, the thing at the moment here is obviously you're very high grade, but it's now about proving up scale, right? Yeah. And I think obviously you've just announced a new drill hole, which potentially indicates that there is potential for scale here. So I wouldn't mind you just talking about that drill hole and, and how you're interpreting that at the moment. Yeah. Well, first of all, in terms of scale, you know, I think this is the year that we're going to transition to scale. Uh, we have a number of discoveries outside of Rainbow. We have the Alchemist. And then more recently, we discovered the Descendant discovery uh, that you mentioned that we, we announced. So we did a step out to confirm that discovery. That area of the property actually is the dates back, to, uh, expiration dates back there, predating the result of Flint Flood Orbun, uh, which, you know, they operated Flint Flood for a century. And the reason why everybody came to the specific area was because it's the largest felsic volcanic rock package map to surface in the entire belt. That's close to 90% of the mines ever boasted are boasted the felsic. So if you're looking outside of the felt six, you're looking at the wrong rock package. And at surface in this area of the property, there's an alteration system that spans at least 700 by 1100 meters. And for those that are unfamiliar with alteration systems, it essentially is mapping the fluid flow of the volcanic event. Uh, we're, we're looking for deposits that were deposited from subsea floor volcanic activity. So the bigger the volcano, the bigger the eruption, the bigger the correlating deposit. Yep. And so the, the last true explorer is explored of Pine Bay, which is our property, was in the early 1990s. Uh, Plastome had a 30 million ton exploration target in the area. Inmet followed up with over a 20 million ton exploration target in the area. And um, it took us a number of years to, to really kind of have things click for us, but we really think we're on to that. We uh, had some steps in 2016 actually extending both Plastodome's at drill holes and Inmet's drill holes. Uh, and then as we learned more in the property, as we made other discoveries, we revisited this uh, as many have. That's where the success is coming. So we're very excited about the potential for, you know, very significant resource growth coming from the descent as we move forward with exploration. Good. Okay. Um, I wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about the region um, because obviously this is uh, around Flin Flon and through that process and facility. I think there's been around, what, 90 million tons of high-grade ore go through there. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty well-established mining district along the same trend. And this is something I really would like to really get my head around is how the geology differs between the VMS system corridor that you're on and the old mines that, that have been in production there. I think you had uh, North Star Mine and Don John Mine. Yep. And then also you had the Flinform Mine and the 777 Mine and a few others that yep. were in production. So how does all this land package work? And obviously there is central for scale. We've seen that yep. nearby. And so I just want to get my head around how the how the rocks look in comparison to what's been around yeah. you. So in, in a sense, and, uh, essentially, if you look at where we're located, we're 16 kilometers away from the Flint Flon, 30 minute drive to Castle Road access. And I should mention, we benefit from hydroelectric power on site. Yeah. In terms of the discoveries, the, the felt package at Pine Bay 
dwarfs that in Flintflon with those three mines host that 90 million tons. Uh, so that, again, the fell six or the host rock, you need a large fell package is pre preferable. And then that alteration system. So really pioneers and analogous to the Chisel Lake Basin or So Lake, which is that in the Flintflon Greatest Home Belt, where you have a large accumulation of fell six, mm -hmm. you have a stacking of smaller deposits, and the missing giant in that system was Lawler. Okay. And so we're very similar to that in terms of we have a boat. Very, very large felsic package. We've got a stacking of past producing mines with the Donjon, the Morristar, Star, the Pi B deposit briefly wave. I'm just permitted for a, a sample at a shafts on site there. Uh, and, and so, again, it's different rocks, similar VMS systems that were obviously occurring at a different period of time. Okay. And what's the long term play with the infrastructure already in place? Because there is a a mill that's just been closed down in 2022 that's on care and maintenance. Who owns that? What's the relationship like there? Is there a potential for Tom or using that facility in the future? How are you envisioning sort of what's around you and what you have at the moment? Well, I think all options are always uh, on the table. I think that yeah. <clears throat> if you, uh, you know, pick one path to really limit yourself on all other paths to outcome, yeah. the, the focus of exploration on the property has always been to find a giant yeah. VMS deposit, a, a big one. That okay. can sustain its own infrastructure. Obviously, having the benefit of having that mill sitting idle in the town is, is a, a tremendous opportunity for the company, uh, but it's not the only outcome. There's also actually another mill that Hudby is operating in, uh, in the Soul Lake area where they're all in the concentrate flint flon, and those tracks are actually going back empty. So there's a lot of different avenues to play in, but again, our long term vision it was always build up. You know, and discover a very large, sustainable, long-term mining operation at Pine Bay through multiple production sources. And now you're seeing these discoveries emerge and the next path for us is to, do, to grow scale. Okay. But in terms of relationship, I mean, everybody on my team with the exception of myself has spent a part of their career uh, at Hutt Bay. Okay. Uh, Hutt Bay has a, a, a tremendous track record for production and infrastructure there in the town. Um, and, you know, I think that while it is an, an opportunity, it's not the only opportunity, it's one of many opportunities that we are, you know, taking a look at as we advance things through exploration in time B. Yeah, sure, okay. Um, and I guess, what are the next steps for you? Because it's, one of the questions I was going to ask you was, is there a possible faster route to cash flow because of that infrastructure around you? But it sounds like you're, you're looking for scale, like you were just saying there. You want to find a very meaningful, sizable deposit that one way or another, you could either build it yourself or use infrastructure around you. But it's yours and, and it's it's going to be meaningful. What If you are going down that path at the moment, what are the next steps for you guys based on the current drill results that you've just received? How are you going about this exploration model to to increase the volume? Certainly, so a lot of the success that we've had is new ideas. Yeah. Doing something different. I mean, Albert Einstein, I think one of the stated definition of insanity is doing the same thing over, expecting a different outcome. Yeah. And that was really what it has occurred in, in, in a lot of this base metal camps around the world is it's like a one trick pony. You know, you do one thing, that's how you find mines in this particular area. And the discovery of a rainbow deposit 2020 is really a kind of um, a validation of that. We kind of threw the old rule book out the door and came up with new ideas, bringing in IP. Uh, and that technology helped aid us in vectoring towards that new discovery. Uh, so what we've done and in the process of doing is a magneto tolaric survey. And MT looks for the same rock property in terms of resistivity, or, or lack thereof, um, as, as a rock property that IP does, uh, but its ability to see deeper. And so what we're doing is that, that MT survey to see deeper and really match the structure and the potential uh, uh, for what the size of the descendant could be at depth based upon you know, what we see. I mean, the, pro the survey's uh, doing process it's in the aid exploration going forward, but I think what you can expect from us certainly uh, this year is going to be an aggressive drilling campaign to build the volume and significantly grow the resource base from you know the nearly six million tons we have announced. Uh, it's a much much more. Okay. I think really just the beginning in many ways for us. And obviously these, these are quite deep systems. Um, are there any sort of I don't I wouldn't know if they work or not, but is there any sort of downhole EM work you could do or anything where you can sort of get down there and and use technology to, to discover based on the drilling that you've done? Yeah, so we, we do use uh, Borbo EM. Okay. Uh, that's a key vectoring tool for us. So we really use all the tools. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I think that a limitation of what was used before is really having it reliant just on maybe surface pulse EM. Yeah. With you drill it and use Borbo EM to help you. 
the discovery of Rainbow in 2020, we brought in IP, which gave us that resistivity. And that resistivity is actually more mapping your, your disseminated pyrite or your low concentrations of mineralization around your, your deposit. Because in these deposit styles, you just don't go from barren rock to high grade to barren rock. Yep. So you're looking for a halo, which creates a much larger target for you to explore for. And so we used the IP coincident with Borable EM. We drilled into the ISO shell, the resistivity target, but then used Borable EM to give us a direct vector to Rainbow. Okay. So we utilize that as a tool, along with obviously geology, geochemistry is a very important role uh, in exploration for the team. Okay, um, so obviously you're saying you want to do a load more drilling this year, um, really widen out what, you've, what you think you've discovered at the, at the recent discovery. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit about the WIPs and the mineability, and have you done any met work at all on, uh, I know it's essentially similar host rocks to what's around you, so we, this, you, you'd assume that the met's probably fine, but have you done any of that sort of work in terms of how the mine work could, plan could potentially look down the line, or, or how the met looks at all? Yeah, so in terms of your first question, you know, your, your mineable width for a VMS system is round down to about two and a half meters uh, true width. Uh, rainbow is about eight meters true thickness. Uh, and, you know, we, the stuff that we've hit in Descendant is much even wa much more wider, uh, significant in terms of widths in the early the couple of them have in Descendant. So why we believe we can build a volume there uh, much more quickly than we have at Rainbow. In terms of your question on metallurgy, we haven't done any metallurgical test work on the deposits. Uh, to date as of yet. You did mention on the same structure, growth fault corridor, you do did have two past producers in the Donjon, yep. North Star Mine. And additionally about, you know, three and a half kilometers to the south along the same trend of most rainbow was the past producing Centennial Line. Okay. So there hasn't been uh, a deposit that was broken uh, by Met in the flood falls history. Again, this is a jurisdiction that's seen 32 mines go into production. And our technical team has been credited with half of us and three of the four largest. Uh, so again, I think and this met goes that will come when time is right but our focus is squarely on exploration like uh, over the next 12 months and how are you looking at the future of, of the company it's um obviously markets are pretty tough in general we're talking to a lot of people here at PDAC and it's uh, are you are you looking at going in this alone or or are you oh, it, I, I'd imagine the the drilling's quite deep uh, would 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 find in a JV or finding a partner or, or what, what are your shareholders telling you what what What's the current thinking in the corporate strategy side of things in terms of progressing? Well, I think we brought on one of my colleagues, Peter R. Jones, last year for a reason. And Peter's the founding CEO of Hud Bay. He built 777, capitalized that. Yeah. He also led the initial discovery and development of Lawler. He helped capitalize that. And he's engineered one of the biggest mines in Flint Pond. So as the company grows and transitions, we're going to continue to attract the talent and expertise uh, to facilitate us taking to the production decision and, and transition to a producer. Now, so you know, businessman, my investors are here to make money. I'm here to make money as a yeah. significant shareholder of the company. If something happens between now and then, you know, all the better, and that's something we'll evaluate as time goes on. Yeah. Uh, but again, we are the creators of our own destiny, and we're going to continue to march that path forward. Yeah. Keep in mind, we're not a poor free deposit that's remote where you're having a billion dollar capex. We're gonna be much lower on that capex curve. We're also in an area that there's rule of law. You have rich mining history. Flint Fall was founded on mines. And right now the community is actually going two weeks on, two weeks off, you know, quite a significant distance. They're taking it from their family. And I, I guarantee you, um, you know, their wives or their husbands or whatever and the children prefer to see their family around. And that's that, you know, yeah. human capital component of, of Flint Fall that is often overlooked. Yeah, and I, you know, I'd, I'd actually say as well, if, you, if your theory is right in terms of finding these larger whips, the grades that you'll be pulling these out of, you'd hope the market would recognize that. I mean, 3% copper is, uh, is, pretty, is pretty healthy. Um, and I think you, you'd like to think that a re-rate would potentially be on the table if uh, with the drill bit. I think discovery is still probably the one thing that the market does reward. So yeah, um, yeah best of luck. And I guess... Just looking out here for the next 12 months, are there, are there any other catalysts we should be looking out for? Well, it, before we get back to drilling, that's certainly going to be what drives us. Yeah. And I think that, it, you know, at the end of the day, if you look at these major discoveries out there, it takes six, seven years to make. And we're in a position where it did take us that time, but we got started a lot earlier. Yeah. And I think what's coming in the copper space is the reality of the lack of investment and capital or on the exploration side. 
And the fact that you have these declining rates globally, while you have so many inflationary pressures, it's going to have a big impact on the supply side while you're in demands, you know, increasing for obvious reasons that we've discussed many times over. And so that we're in a very unique situation that we have a discovery that's now maturing that we started in a much less favorable cop price environment. A lot of people get excited and then much money spent in exploration, but that often doesn't drive discoveries. Yeah. And, you know, to be a kind of a leader uh, in that process, to have a, a mature discovery, exceptionally high grade, in an area of the world where you have the rule of law and stability, uh, we're checking a lot of boxes and we have a pretty uh, opportunity to transition and in the backdrop of a very promising environment for copper prices uh, and to a producer. And we're also being an underground mine, being very, very high gray and how the deposits sit underground and having access to low cost, clean baseload power on site is really gonna uh, you know, let us shine as things progress with the company because as us drawing down a lot of these open kit mines yeah. is the amount of volume of rock you have to move and volume of rock is more people and a lot more energy intensity. Yeah, and you see this with a lot of the large mines now with open pits. It's reducing the cutoff year after year as well and it's just becoming yeah. more and more costly, right? And uh, your margins are getting squeezed, squeezed, squeezed. Yeah, yeah. You know, we look to be a high margin operation when we transition to that. I mean, we've got a lot of work to do before we get there. Uh, but certainly the grades are there, the location's there, and the infrastructure is there for that to, to come to fruition. Are you, I don't know, I, don't, I can't remember what the, the regulations are nowadays, but are you allowed to, you were talking about expiration targets and estimates that your predecessors had had, had before. Uh, is there a figure in mind in terms of where you want to get this deposit to in terms of, in terms of scale or where you think it could potentially go? You know, our technical team has been credited and awarded for the discovery of three of the four largest mines of Flint Fund. We have a member of the Canadian Mining Hall, uh, Canadian Mining uh, Hall of Fame. Yep. Two Bill Dennis Awards for the Lawler and 77 mines. And um, these people didn't join and haven't dedicated a part of their career uh, to look for a, a small deposit. Yeah. That's not a, really where they're And we only are aiming for big. Okay, Max, perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much.